Ok, allora benvenuti, benvenuti a tutti. Eh, la, stasera abbiamo veramente... Uh, io, anzi, poiché è una, la conferenza in inglese, passo all'inglese. Uh, we're in for a treat. Uh, to, tonight uh, we, um, uh, we have a, a very special guest and speaker, Professor Vernius, who was uh, very, very well known in uh, Egyptology and has written on a broad range of subjects, especially in philology and linguistics, but not exclusively. Um, and... Um, Professor uh, Vernus um, uh, has been a scientific member of the Institut Français d'Archéologie uh, okay, um, du Caire, and he, uh, he, 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 uh, he is a, a former professor um, um, at the École Pratique des Hautes Études, which is where I first met him. I've, I followed his uh, Middle Egyptian uh, grammar, grammar courses, and... Um, Uh, he uh, he um, uh, went on to, uh, his, he has taught at Ein Shams University in Cairo, Yale University uh, in the U.S., uh, at the Nova Universidad uh, in Lisbon, and at the Autonoma Universidad in, in, uh, in Barcelona, and uh, he has also has an archaeological activity with uh, the Sp Spanish mis mission since, for, for a long, long time, because I remember this way. You already were doing this like 20 years ago or more than that, uh, 30. And, um, um, and he, uh, he has published about 200 con contributions about history, religion, literature, the language and writing of the ancient Egyptians. And among his publications are Dictionnaire des Pharaons, Affaires scandales sur les, les Ramsès, Chant de de l'Egypte antique, Sagesse de l'Egypte pharaonique, Dictionnaire amoureux de l'Egypte pharaonique, et Le Bestiaire de Pharaon, which he wrote uh, uh, with uh, Jean Yoyot. And uh, may I add that some of his articles have been uh, important inspirations be 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 behind some of the displays uh, in the gallery of writing that we have recently uh, inaugurated here in this museum. So it is uh, with uh, great pleasure that I, I leave the, the floor to Uh, Monsieur Venus uh, with his, uh, and his lecture on Egyptian hieroglyphs and the issue of figurativity in the most ancient scripts. Thank you very much, Mr. Poole. You see, I'm very much honored to be to speak in this museum, which is one of the best museums in the world, and in which the spirit of Egyptology on ancient Egypt is reviving. I will deal today with something which is known, but not very well known, and I think I will try to deepen our understanding on the problem of iconicity. Jean-François Champollion, this fragment is justly celebrated everywhere. Indeed, it is a real tour de force to have found out the very complicated processes through which the Egyptians were able to graphically, graphically encode any possible production of their language. When I say graphically encoding, Any, any, any possible production of language with a restricted number of signs, this is a definition of writing. Be very careful. There is two meanings for writing. You have the wide meaning, the anthropologist meaning, which is any, any trace, any track on uh, support is a writing. This is legitimate, I have nothing against. But you have now the stronger uh, definition in which writing is encoding any uh, part of the language. And there is a big difference between the two. Both are legitimate, I'm, but you should be uh, very careful not to confound one with the other. So I'm speaking of writing in the restricted meaning of the word, in the strong meaning of the word, that is a code with which you can theoretically uh, encode anything of, or, or any production of the language, which is not true of uh, writing in the wide sense, because, for instance, if you want to, to, uh, to encode with uh, a, a large conception of writing uh, les, uh, le, le, something difficult, you cannot. Bon. So, uh, 
what was unhassing the, the a priori mystery of Egyptian writing was the fact that the Egyptians implemented a script whose signs, the hieroglyphs, were pictures, referring to concrete and imaginary, imaginary reality that can be identified, needless to say, with more or less accuracy, even by somebody alien to ancient Egyptian universe. So this is very easy. I just show you something. Everybody knows that. This is a picture of a very interesting tomb, which is very known in the south of Egypt, near Aswan. Look, anybody, even if he has not any knowledge of ancient Egypt, can recognize, can identify the hieroglyph. Anybody will certainly uh, understand that is a ram, that is an elephant, that is a mouse, that is uh, water, and so on. So this is the main property of ancient Egyptian writing, the fact that its elements are picture. This is a fact which is well known. What I want to, to do now is to do Egyptologia for Egyptologia. That means I want to see how, how extended is the use of picture in the most ancient writing in the world. You understand my point? Of course, Egypt, ancient Egypt is writing with use picture. Is ancient Egypt the only one, or are there other picture, ancient picture, I mean, in the world, which also use uh, picture as element of writing? So I'm trying to widen the perspective. Alors, to make people understand what is uh, figurative is very easy. The Egyptian hieroglyph write the sound M. It can be termed figurative because it depicts something that anybody can roughly identify. The European letter M write the sound M. It cannot be termed figurative because it does not depict anything that could be identified. So it's a very basic uh, definition. Now, please have a look at that map. In that map, the stars are the birthplace of writing. I will go in detail, but you can see, it's very interesting to see that all the birthplace of writing are in the north, and they extend from China, China, as you can see here, to Mesoamerica. In all the star pointed a birthplace of a writing, I mean of pristine writing. What I, mean, what I mean by pristine writing is something you should understand. Sometimes, by using the label pristine, I mean a writing whose script has a science inventory which does not show, as a whole, any undebatable similarity with or dependence on the science inventory of any other writing excluding sporadic case of mere coincidence. Please, this is a little bit di difficult. With respect to the most ancient writing, the sign inventory should be taken as a criterion, not the underlying system. I will explain this. For instance, let us take Meroitic. Meroitic standard writing on the left, and the Meroitic hieroglyph writing on the, for you is on the right, are borrowed from Egyptian hieroglyph. So it cannot be uh, classified as a pristine writing. No, both writing as original writing. Why it cannot uh, be classified as a pristine writing? Because its element derived from another writing. But it is an original writing because the underlying system, which is syllabic, is original. So you understand my distinction? This is a little bit difficult, but it should be very important. I mean by pristine uh, writing which of we, whose uh, signs d d had no relationship with any other uh, writing system. And dealing with the Meroetic, we cannot say it is pristine. It's the same thing for something very interesting, proto-Sinaitic. 
Everybody knows what is protocinetic. Protocinetic is a writing used by the workmen which was working in, uh, under the, the Egyptian since the 19th century BC. And what is very interesting, it is a Semitic writing, but it uses Egyptian hieroglyph. I made you see a, t uh, a table and you can see the relationship between uh, the uh, Egyptian sign and the uh, protosyllabic sign. For instance, this sign, which is Egyptian, was used by protosemitic with another value. And I just tell you something in confidence. This thing is nothing but the, uh, the ancestor of our A. When we write the world war, you write hieroglyph, you write this sign. It's not, a, a, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking, we can't trace the evolution, but never, never mind. What is interesting is the fact that uh, proto sinaitic is original, since it is alphabetic, but it is not pristine, since it uses signs which are from another system. You understand my point? So now we can, we can list all the true, pristine, ancient writing system. So, I'm come back uh, to my map. You see the map here. There is the first place. The first birth place is China. I will go uh, closer to after. China's writing is starting roughly in the 13th century BC. The second is Valley of Andus is very important. I will lean, I will deal a little bit after that. The third is Iranian Plateau, Proto Ilamite. The fourth is Mesopotamia, Proto Cuneiform. The five, sorry, the fifth is Anatolia Hittite. The, the sixth is Egypt, of course. <laughs> the seventh is Asian world, Cretan and perhaps Cyprus, and the eighth is uh, Mesoamerica. Now I'm going back to each of this writing. Let us, let us know that contrary to a still widespread idea, there is no unique cradle of writing. The most ancient original writing were invented independently in different parts of the world at different moments. Now, now, it cannot be ruled out that in some cases, the very idea of writing was a matter of external influence. For instance, why, as far as we consider its sign, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph system is clearly pristine, some scholars think that the idea of uh, writing could have been borrowed from Mesopotamia, given in strong cultural influence on Egypt during the period that precedes the birth of writing in Egypt, as illustrated by the glyphic and other artifacts. Legitimate as may be this kind of hyp hypothesis, it seems safer not to take it into account when determining the most ancient pristine writing and to rely only on the shape and appearance of the sign. So, the first birthplace, I come back, Chinese writing. Chinese writing began roughly in the 13th century BC. China's writing was originally implementing a full figurative script before it underwent a strong stylization. But you can see some remains of this figurativity. For instance, in this inscription here, look, you, you can see the arrow, you can recognize a man. Another example, I give you a copy of uh, an inscription which is in Shanghai Museum, and here, it's clearly a picture. You can recognize a scorpion which means uh, 10,000 in China, never mind. So uh, China, in its beginning, was using picture as a sign. That is for the first birth, birth place. The second birth place is something which is not known, and it is a pity. 
It is a pity because it's perhaps one of the most interesting civilizations. But if you uh, ask people, people know ancient Egypt, people know Mesopotamia, but uh, the Arapaean writing, nobody knows. And, and uh, however, it was extending on a large, uh, on a large uh, territory for Mr. Owen Muller, there is much to do. And uh, uh, you can see, it's here. And it was a very, very uh, evoluted civilization with many cities, very urbanized. But what is interesting, it's date from two, uh, 2000 and, and 500 BC. But what's interesting is that this civilization also has its writing. We have perhaps 2,000 uh, objects like that, and you can see here signs which seems to be uh, some picture, for instance, nothing, nobody can miss this. Is. So it's a very interesting civilization. We call it the Arapan civilization of the Mohanjo Diaro civilization, because, but I think a great effort should be done to, uh, to make people know a, a little bit the civilization which is in our culture not known, and it is a pity because it's really an incredible civilization. I've given you, uh, for instance, we, uh, a bird I've been found which is very, uh, very big and which shows that uh, Arapaean writing was not limited to little objects. So this is the second uh, birth place. The third birth place is the, what we call plateau Iranian. And the first, the most ancient writing is Proto-Ilamite. Proto-Ilamite uh, was uh, uh, used in something like uh, uh, 3000 BC. But please be very careful. Recently, another Ilamite writing has been reportedly uh, deciphered by your French people. This is linear ilamite. It's not the same thing. Proto-ilamite writing is more ancient than il linear ilamite. And uh, so makes the difference. Now I give you, so you see the, the plateau, the, the Iranian plateau with the, the town of uh, Suz, which is the most important city. Now I give you some examples, just to, to figure out what was the uh, proto ilamite writing. You have some examples here. You can observe that sometimes we see some signs which are pictures, clearly. I give you other examples. So this was the, the third uh, birth place. Now the first birth place is the most ancient in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, everybody knows where it is, huh? between the Tigr uh, Tigris and Euphrates, here. And uh, people agree now that uh, the most ancient writing in Mesopotamia should be dated about uh, 3,300, something like this. Of, co of course, we have, have a little difference, but it's 3,000. And what is very interesting is that uh, at its beginning, the, the signs were picture. You see a man who, who is drinking. You, you have a hand. After that, of course, uh, this uh, writing will uh, undergo a strong evolution of which we, I will speak after. But originally, the most ancient writing in the world, 3,300, 3, was figurative. F uh, another birthplace is Hittite, Hittite hieroglyph. The Hittite kingdom is, was a very great uh, kingdom which was in Anatolia with the capital, Hattusa, and which extended uh, until Syria. What is interesting is that at the beginning, Hittite, uh, the Hittite civilization used cuneiform, and suddenly, in, uh, the, in the 14th century BC, they discover a new writing which is uh, hieroglyphic. I, you have, I'm giving some example, for instance this. 
This is very interesting because you can see that this writing is highly figurative. You can recognize a man who is drinking. You can uh, recognize uh, a, ma uh, a hand which is holding a stick and so on. And this writing uh, was uh, in, uh, used by uh, Hittite for writing a special dialect, which is Luvit. But the problem is not here. Yes, what is interesting, and suddenly, a civilization which was using uh, Akkadian or cuneiform writing found out a new writing which is figurative. Alors, the five, of course, is Egypt. I will be very quickly for Egypt, on, but except for one thing. Perhaps uh, 10 years or 20 years ago, uh, there was a very interesting discovery by a German archaeologist, a very good German archaeologist, Gunther Dreyer. He discovered at Abydos a huge tomb of a king of that time in which there were many tags like this. And uh, the theory of uh, Dreyer, Dreyer was that that was the first uh, writing in the world because the tomb can be dated for 3,500. But now there is a new, a new idea among the specialists of writing. Uh, they think that it is not a true writing. It is, of course, a proto-writing, but it is not a writing in the very narrow meaning of the word. So ancient Egypt, the most ancient writing with, uh, which can be ascertained is this one, which date from uh, 3,200, 3,100. So, I, of course, I pass on Egypt. I will come back after that. Another birthplace, the seventh birthplace, is Aegean writing. Aegean means Mediterranean. We have two birthplaces in Mediterranean. The first is Quita. And in Creta, we have two writing, two original writing. First of all, the Cretan hieroglyph from 1900 and Linear A. Despite what, what might suggest its label, Linear A is not a cursive style of the Cretan hieroglyph. Both share a certain number of signs. In both, some signs are obviously figurative. I'll give you an example, it will be pretty clear. This is Cretan hieroglyph. You can recognize sometimes some picture uh, here. Now, linear A. You can see also that it implements many uh, figurative things, for instance, an axe. What is interesting, this is also linear A. Both share a lot of signs. For instance, in Cretan hieroglyph, you have this one, and you have this one in linear A. This is a table in which uh, were pointed out all the signs which were shared by both writing. The problem is that we don't know the writing. We cannot read the writing. We don't know anything about the language. And we are still without idea. Now, be very careful. Linear A is entirely different with Liner B. Liner B uses the sign of Liner A, but for writing a language which we can read because it is Greek. This was, yes, this was one of the most uh, impressive discovery by two uh, English workmen, uh, Chadwick and Van Tuel. They discovered that uh, they, they were able to read, and they discovered that uh, the Greek have been using uh, the sign of liner A to write liner B, another language. So it's just to make the difference. We have another uh, center of uh, writing, but I cannot ascertain that it is really pristine, is Cyprus with the Cyprus Minoan writing, which is using linear A uh, sign, but we cannot read it. The last birthplace is perhaps one of the most important ones, is the Mesoamerica. 
Imagine that from Panama until the north of Mexico, you have uh, many civilizations which are, um, most of them are not known, are still to be discovered. And these civilizations were using many writing. The most ancient Mesoamerican writing can be dated from 700, 600 BC. One example is this Olmec writing. Olmec is a civilization from that, which is certainly a writing, as the, we can see the fact it is organized. And we have Zapotec, in, uh, another civilization, which also dates from 600 before Christ. But, of course, the most important writing in Mesoamerica is Mayan script. Mayan script Mayan writing are dated from the second century BC until the, the six, uh, century, uh, 16th century AC. And it was very much used, not only on stone, uh, on steel, but also on pottery. I've given you some examples uh, which, which is very impressive of this writing. Of course, it is highly figurative. You can recognize human, visa, human face and so on. This script was used very, in a very sophisticated manner. For instance, here, you can, there is a difference between the general right, instruction and, oh, and the caption which are here. So, Mesoamerica was a very important birthplace. We cannot now make a genealogy. We cannot know whether Olmec is the ancestor of Mayan writing and so on. But what is absolutely certain is that Mayan writing is something which is very closely bound to Egyptian, bound typologically, yeah, <laughs> not genetically. Okay. So, what is uh, striking in uh, all this uh, review of the most ancient pristine writing in the world is that most of them were implementing picture, at least at the outset. But of course, the evolution was different. Some lost their picture, for instance, Chinese and the cuneiform. Some kept their picture until the end, for instance, Egyptology and Mayan. And so we can see that uh, uh, the problem which is raised is the problem of how to account of the, the picture, what is the relation of picture with writing in general. And so there is the first problem of terminology. Most of, most of time, the term used to describe picture in writing is iconicity. But iconicity is too loose and too, uh, is not, I think it should not be used as a word. I think that uh, we have another kind of classification. This is a little bit difficult, but I will try to be clear. I think that uh, now any writing is iconic at the minimum base because the only fact of writing vertically uh, horizontally, in spiral, it's all, uh, already iconic. So I don't want to use the term iconic in a loose way. I prefer to speak of iconicity as a general pr property which is scalar. That means that you have degree. And this is what I'm going to try to show you now. The iconicity should be rather understood as a scalar characteristic not as a separate category. Scripts can be classified according to the relationship of their thing with culturally identifiable picture on the following scale of iconicity. You have ground zero, abstract thing, geometric signs, geometric signs overdetermined, abstract and geometric sign, abstract and geometric sign evolving a resilient figurativity, and the highest level, figurativity, in which we are going to rejoin Egypt, ancient Egypt. So I've described each ground. 
The first ground, please have a look at this. This is a Divagari inscription in India. At first, when you look at the sign, they are abstract since they did not... Oh là là, j'ai fait... Il est là, le technicien, là, j'ai fait une bêtise. Euh... Sorry. To... To the... Je sais pas ce que... Voilà, OK. OK, thank you much. Thank you much. So, each sign is abstract because they did not refer to any object that could be identified. This is the first ground, abstract sign, which refer only to themselves. Now, now, when you look again to this uh, uh, inscription, you can see that why there are signs which cannot identify to anything. You have other signs which can be mental image at the minimum. For instance, here you have to point. Here you have to stick. So my second degree is uh, what I see, geometric sign. Geometric sign are sign which should not be uh, confused with abstract sign. They, they are mental image. It's not the same thing that a sign which do not refer to anything but himself. For instance, uh, uh, geometric signs are very used in ogamic script, which is used and which implement only notches and point. Now there is a third degree. Geometric sign which are overdetermined. What I mean by overdetermined? Let us consider the Korean alphabet. At first glance, the signs seem to refer to elementary geometric figures or to patterns made of them, and as such, they possess a minimal degree of iconicity as far as we may assume that these figures or patterns were thematized in the Korean cultural universe. Furthermore, they do have a stronger iconic component as expressly stated by their own inventor, King Senjong. In the decree he promulgated for the creation of a new alphabet, he stipulated that the shape of the basic sign made of elementary geometric figures were chose so as to depict the position of the phonotary organs during the process of pronunciation. For instance, here, the, 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 the letter M, is, is geometric, but all, it is also overdetermined because it uh, imitates the position of the lips when you say M. You understand my point? So this is the third degree. Now, we have seen already the problem. There are things that were or the original picture, but we lost their appearance in the course of time. The most emblematic uh, case is, of course, cuneiform. Here is a cuneiform tablet in which the scribe put the ancient form, which was figurative, and the new form, which is entirely uh, cuneiform. You, this is well de uh, defined by Whitaker. The script gradually evolved over this period from one in which signs were incised by means of a pointed stylus in relative close conformity with the shape of the depicted item to one in which wedges formed by impressing rather than incising, the sign had become constricted to a fixed range of angle. So this is a, a case of a, a, of a writing which lost its original figurativity. And uh, I, I give you an example. I, I have shown you the example of proto uh, cuneiform, and you can compare with true cuneiform. You can see the evolution. There is another, another case which is more subtle. I, I, I'm going to speak of resilient figurativity. Of course, Chinese sign lost their original picture. When you see uh, a text in Chinese, you cannot recognize any picture. But what is interesting, it's difficult to understand, that for a Chinese, 
the signs are still figurative. If you speak with the Chinese and you say, I, I, this doesn't represent anything, he says, yes, it represents, it is a picture. And what is uh, uh, symbolic of that is that some Chinese characters are based, the meaning are based on picture meaning. For instance, to uh, see the last, uh, the, the last uh, group character, Chinese character here, it means Ming, it means brightened. It's two uh, signs. When you see the modern sign, you cannot understand. You say, okay, it's you know, purely aleatory. But the Chinese would say, no, it's not, uh, it's not uh, it's, there are pictures. It's a picture of the sun and the picture of the moon and the two means uh, brilliant. You understand me what I, what I mean by resilient figurativity? For a foreigner, it's not figurative. But for a Chinese, it's, it's cultural figurativity. So we should be very cautious with, uh, and I spoke with many Chinese, and they, for all of them, the Chinese are figurative. And this accounts for the meaning of some ca Chinese character. Did you catch my point? It's, it's not easy, okay? Okay. So now I'm going to the last and the highest degree, the figurative. Alors, we have many terms for that, figural, depictive, uh, try to avoid pictorial, but never mind. They can be roughly characterized as being image des choses. That is to say, when they, re they refer to concrete or imaginary realia, that can be identified, needless to say, with more or less accuracy, by foreigners. For instance, in this Maya inscription, anyone can uh, identify the face, the face of an animal of a human hand. For instance, uh, even if you are not a specialist of Maya, you will see an hand in the, uh, 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 in the bottom. But now you see that uh, this definition is very subjective. Okay, a script sign is commonly termed figurative when it depicts an object that can be more or less identified, even by someone foreign to the culture to which the script belongs. But a script can be figurative at different degree, depending on the number of figurative it encompasses. So the term figurative refers to art history, but the problem is subjectivity. For us, Foreigner, we can recognize a hand, a man, but for a Mayan, is other thing was also figurative. So, is there something to avoid cultural subjectivity? And I think there is, uh, there is a possibility. The possibility of defining true figurativity, independent of any cultural subjectivity, should follow the following the criterion. A sign should be categorized as figurative when it depicts a concrete or imaginary realia of the universe within which it was created in the same matter as do the fully fledged picture. So my criterion for a full figurativity is when a picture as a sign is the same as a picture as a Full, fully picture. You understand my point? Of course, what is the, uh, the writing which illustrates the more? Pharaonic Egypt and Egyptian hieroglyph. Of course, look at this. Uh, I've given you a mo Here you have two workmen who are boring uh, a jug. Here you have a representation. The man is boring the enormous part of the jug. It's clear, huh? I think nobody can contest that. This jug is a fully fledged picture. Now look at the caption. The caption, there is a caption which said, this jug is very beautiful. What you see? You see that the jug is the same shape, the same convention as the picture. So this is for me 
what uh, determine the highest place of uh, pharaonic uh, writing in the scale, scale of figurativity is the fact that in ancient Egypt, sign, uh, picture sign were exactly on the same proportion, the same convention, as were the two um, images, the two pictures. This, for me, is the con convention that the hieroglyphy to be characterized as figurative in the strongest sense of the term does not mean that they are exactly on the same plane as the full figure figurative representation. I don't go in detail, but of course, hieroglyphs are figure, uh, representation, but to be hieroglyphs, they undergo three constraints, constraints of size, constraints of arrangement, constraints of orientation. I don't go more in this, in this problem, but you know, I repeat. Iconicity, for me, is a scale. Degree zero, uh, abstract sign. For de, another degree, geometric sign. Other degree, geometric sign over, uh, over determined. Five degree, uh, writing which lost their uh, pictorial characteristic, for instance, cuneiform. Six degree, thing which lost their uh, pictorial characteristic, but which are considered by their cultural environment as true writing, a resilient writing. And the highest degree is, of course, uh, when a sign can be uh, identified not only by a foreign, somebody foreigner to the culture, but when the sign is exactly re uh, designed as the true figure, uh, as a true representation. So you, I, I suppose you understand my point. Now, I'm going to finish. The figurativity of the hieroglyph, which I try to describe, had two contrary consequences on the posterity of pharaonic civilization. On the one hand, it, if it fell into oblation at the end of the Roman period, it is because neither the Byzantine Empire, which was under the influence of iconoclast trend, nor the Islamic State, where representation were generally banned, had showed any sympathy let and any tolerance for monuments decorated with what appear to depict men, animals, recognizable objects, and sometimes demonic manifestations. I give you a picture of the Temple of Philae on which you have the cross over the hieroglyph, because hieroglyph has demonic manifestation. Now, on the other end, if the pharaonic civilization rose such interest and esteem in the classical antiquity, it is because Greek and Latin writers had been struck by the figurativity of the hieroglyph. They, alors, they, they judge that such a figurativity could not be in line with the mere writing system. It could be accounted only for by their functioning as symbol and closing an esoteric knowledge. This is very in, in, uh, important to uh, underline. When the Greek show the hieroglyph, they were under the idea that the Egyptians were very religious. And they say, how can in the temple religious men write picture of terrestrial object, uh, food, animal, and so on? And the idea is that this is a cryptic uh, writing. The, uh, if the hieroglyph are figurative, it is because they carry a secret meaning outside the, uh, the meaning which is supposed to them. And this, uh, uh, this uh, means the Greek to think that the hieroglyph were enclosing an esoteric knowledge, which they try to accommodate with the Neoplatonism. Thus, they developed an image of the ancient Egyptian civilization as the original source of thought and philosophy. Their original Egyptomania, because Greek were, and Latin were a little bit Egyptomaniac, had turned into what may be called Egyptosophia. 
This image was transmitted to the Western culture from the residence onward and elicited an obscurantist vision of pharaonic Egypt that, for instance, culminating in the shaman Kershaw elucubation and inspired uh, the, the masterpiece Magic Flute of Mozart. Paradoxally, the fact that the hieroglyph were a picture, far from helping the decipherment, was rather an obstacle, since it was stubbornly thought that all the hieroglyphs were meaning what they represented, which was a deadlock. The genius of Champollion was to understand that a large part of the hieroglyph, why being picture, why being picture, did not mean what they represented, but they mean a sound drawn from the name of what they represented in the Egyptian language, according to the principle of the rebus. Rebus is very important if you want to understand the writing. Rebus is the fact to use an image not from what the image represents, but from the name of what it represents in a, in a given language. For instance, it's, I suppose I write a rat and use, in French, rat. And I use the rat not to write the idea of the animal, but only the sound rat. This is the principle of Rebus, and this is one of the key to understand uh, Egyptian writing and other writing. So uh, the code was corrected by recognizing that the hieroglyph can have ideographic value, meaning what they represent, as well as phonetic value, meaning a sound drawn from the name of what they represent in the Egyptian language. I will finish by returning to the precedent picture I gave. Here, the elephant represents an elephant and does mean elephant. The jug here represents a jug, but does not mean jug, at least in this context, but the sound Hernem, drawn from the name of the gem, Hernem in Egyptian. But now, returning to another picture, here, the jug represents a jug and does mean jug in Egyptian run in the context. So, I suppose, uh, I will finish here, and I suppose you understand now what was the stake of picture and figurativity in the ancient writing, and in ancient Egyptian writing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vernius, for this sweeping overview of pristine scripts and their, their figurativity and the degrees thereof. Um, uh, are there any questions for, for our speaker? May, maybe I will, I will start with one. Uh, there, okay, I, I think I understood what pristine scripts are. They're, it's the repertory, the repertoire of science. Uh, so uh, that the fact that they are not borrowed from anywhere else, but they are developed uh, on your own, so to speak. Uh, and we've seen all these areas where they arise. I think the big, the big question is, okay, so they arise seemingly independently of one another. They arise in different parts of the world. Uh, what strikes me, and we were discussing before the, the lecture, we were discussing that monumentality already appears like before 10, 000, before 10 or 12,000 years ago in some places. But what strikes me is that they, in terms of world history, all these pristine scripts appear in, within a very narrow span of time, only a few thousand years, which is nothing in terms of uh, the, the, the history of humanity. And I think that is the big a very big question. And another big question is the geographical repartition. Because, for instance, let us compare Mesoamerica and South America. In South America, you have very great civilization. The Inca, but other civilization. In Peru, we have dozens of civilizations with monumental production. And this civilization was very much advanced. They did not use the writing. 
and Mesoamerica use writing. Why? I cannot say. But you see, there is something which is affadad in the repetition of uh, the discovery of, uh, uh, of writing. Uh, many people think that writing was bound to administration. This is true, for instance, for uh, Acadian, for, uh, this is absolutely true. But in other countries, this is not true. For instance, in my uh, civilization, uh, writing has nothing to do with uh, administration. It is mainly a, a, a problem of ideology. So what is, uh, I think there is still many mystery about the problem of writing. Writing is not so uh, one-sided as somebody uh, is uh, very easily supposed to, 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 uh, to believe. So th this is the problem. And the problem of the narrow uh, time or period of time is also very interesting. But this is a problem of uh, philosophy, of uh, history, of at least prehistory. Um, Monsieur Gobey perhaps has an idea about that. Uh, no. hmm? But you, you can, uh, we have a, a micro. No, for w what you... What you meant, and if I may, oh, thank you, is that I indeed the, uh, the, the appearing, and it all depends on the context, and the need can only be understood uh, without our filtering system. We need then to go back to the context, where it was meant to be, how it was invented, and then in order really to understand fully what it meant for themselves. And I would say this is the, the general key I would need, yes, to to highlight, to emphasize. Yeah. And if you can find that key, then you will unlock the whole thing. Uh, you want uh, exactly what you want exactly, because I did not hear very much. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I, w I wanted to say, if you are able to go back to the, the time of that civilization and then to go back into the context where the writing was used and into the specific context, then you will be able to, to understand and unlock the key and try to not to use your own filter system, but then you to, um, to try to fit most to the, the, the concept that uh, led the people then to invent and to use them uh, as they wanted to, to, to use them, I would say, yes. But uh, this is the, the only thing which strike, the most thing which strikes me is a different context, you see. We cannot say that writing was due to an, uh, one context. Of course, many, many times, it's administration. This, this is absolutely true. It's true, for instance, of Liner B. Liner B was used in palace administration, no problem. This is true also for cuneiform. Why in cuneiform? We have also other kind of text, but originally, a cuneiform was used for administration. But this is not true for Maya. In Maya, you have, a, you know, what is Mesoamerica? Mesoamerica was divided in many little towns, which how each has its king and which each has its civilization and which use writing for purely ideology uh, problems. And uh, also we say that uh, writing is very often bound to uh, kingdom, to kingship. This is true, absolutely true, to power, but not always. Not always. For instance, we have uh, in a kind of Libyan writing which is bound only to, uh, to play. This is very striking. At the end of the day, the young people, which are in the desert, they joined themselves and they made uh, inscription. And this writing, Tifinar, is used only only for people to, uh, to, 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 to rejoice and to, to play. So what uh, I have no, th no global theory I would like to have, but what I could say is we should not be one-sided. Uh, writing may arise in very different, uh, different times. And one thing which interests you, which is very interesting also, is the discovery of Haring. We, sometimes uh, we say that uh, picture becomes uh, writing, but sometimes uh, writing becomes again picture. We you know the, the discovery of Haring, that the sign which was used in Deril Medine, which was a hieroglyph, was demoted only as uh, picture to picture. So I think that writing is something very, uh, which is multifaceted problem, and the only thing I say, not to be one-sided. One
Oui, exactement. So I, I was, I, I'm not sure I was very, this is a very difficult, a little bit difficult, but did you reach my, my principal point and the problem of picture? And the, there is a, a very difficult relationship between picture and writing. But what is striking is that, of course, most of the, uh, the, first, the first movement to, body, to somebody who, who uses writing is to, of course, to use figure. Picture, but this is not always true, and there is a great evolution about that. So, uh, has anybody any questions on that? I, I actually, uh, you were speaking of I could, the iconicity of even the most abstract writing in a way. There, it, it, there, I think uh, maybe in the measure that writing is a way to encode speech, yes. well, I would say that speech itself is iconic. Usually we argue, no, speech is just symbols. It's dog in, uh, in, in English, it's can in Italian, it's chien in, in, in French, hunt, and, and, so, and so on. Uh, but uh, there are some features of speech that are iconic. One is that uh, sp speech, if you, t if you tell something, speech follows the, the, the time, a time sequence. And so when C Caesar says, veni, vidi, vici, first he came, then he saw, and then he won. So, okay, and that is iconic, and in, so in, in this sense... This, uh, this is a problem of linearity of the language. The exactly. term is linearity of the language is, uh, is always linear. Why a picture is not linear. A picture, you can go from here to here to here. But, but if you write language, then... The, you you concise the two. You start becoming linear too. And, and you see why there is a, a problem which I think I can solve. You see, you know, everybody knows that hieroglyph was invented in 3000 BC, but they were still in use in, four, in the first century AEC. So imagine that this kind of writing, which is very difficult, huh, because if you try to write, it's a long time, was used 3,400 years. Why? Why? Because, uh, because uh, what, uh, say, what Mr. Poole said, what the Egyptian writing has two properties. It encodes language, but it encodes also picture. So suppose, suppose you want to capture the essence of something. Huh? I want to capture the essence of the micro. If for an Egyptian, of course not for me, but for an Egyptian, writing an hieroglyph of the micro, you will have the sound of micro and you have the image of micro. So you will concise in writing the, the essence of the reality. And the reason why hieroglyph was used so long is because it concise, first of all, the reality as a phonetic reality, and second, because it, it concise also the reality as a picture. You understand my point? And this accounts for the fact which is for me incredible. How can you use 3,000 uh, and, and, and 500 years a script which is so difficult? Imagine a young people who is writing to, uh, to his uh, friend, to his girlfriend. He's, come, uh, he's starting a letter. The time he, he, he's finished, uh, the girl will go with another <laughs> one. <huh? laughs> So for that, the Egyptians have tachygraphy, that means way of writing, but they maintain the hieroglyph, which was cumbersome, but you can imagine, only because from a philosophical point of view, hieroglyph was a, uh, was a mean of conciling linearity, uh, essence linéaire of the real, and also uh, the essence as a, a pictural essence. That's the reason why they use stereoglyph in 400 BC, eh, which, is, uh, AC, which is incredible. Okay, so. Ci sono ancora domande? Io mi permetto di abusare del fatto che ho il microfono in mano per farne ancora un'altra. No, 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 no. Mr. Venus, I have one last question, uh, because you mentioned, uh, you said, okay, Mayan hieroglyphs are not administrative, cuneiform and linear, linear, linear A and B, or B at least, are certainly are. Uh, okay, so the question is, 
What about hieroglyphs? The very first hieroglyphs were labels attached to vases, but they were in the king's tomb. So are they administrative Alors, or very figurative? Interesting, the very, interesting. The very in but I yeah. think that uh, they are not really do documentary uh, uh, inscription. For instance, uh, I'm not speaking of true writing, but the, the, the label of uh, the, the label are not at all administrative. We know that they were used as a ritual because, uh, first of all, when you use something for administration, things should be easy. When you look at the label, they are in size and colored with past inside. Imagine for an administrative point of view. So I think that contrary to what many people think, the first attested use of IORIF was rather ideology, rather than purely administrative. Uh, and more and more people think, I think, is the same thing. Because when you look at the evidence, the evidence uh, do not uh, follow the administrative uh, concern. They are rather uh, uh, fit for a purely ideological and ritual use. But of course, parallelly, this developed uh, tachygraphy, hieratic, which was used for administrative. So I cannot deny it would be stupid. But I think that as for, as for Egypt, as for Egypt, oh sorry, at, at the beginning, uh, writing was rather uh, was rather created for ideological point of view for the power of the king to be uh, displayed in a very uh, very very clear form. Okay. Uh, allora, io direi a questo punto che ringraziamo molto il professor Ben News per questa, per questa bella lezione.